Hello and welcome to another episode of Cancelled Games where we take a look at some of the unreleased games for a particular console. Today it's the PlayStation 3, which being last gen is probably the most recent system I'll be covering for now. The PS3 has a huge library of games and with it a vast number of cancelled titles. Many of the cancelled games of this generation were also headed to the Xbox 360 and or PC, so some of them you'll see in those episodes in the future. So let's have a look at 35 of the PS3 games that never were. Reich was a first person shooter in development from Ignition Entertainment for the PS3, 360 and PC with a planned October 2010 release. You might be getting some Hitler vibes from this title and you'd be right. Reich is set in an alternate universe 200 years after the Nazis won World War II. It's set in the US in New Berlin, built on the ruins of Washington DC. The city is policed by a secret police force called Death's Hand, kind of a futuristic version of the SS. A resistance group has formed, calling themselves The Chosen. The Chosen have special powers after an experimental project undertaken 60 years prior to the game, including telekinesis and telepathy. They call these abilities Psy Power. Reich's developers promised to reinvent the first person shooter genre by introducing the use of these Psy Powers to the gameplay, allowing players to manipulate the environment and perform an array of acrobatic manoeuvres and physics based attacks. In game, your Psy powers would allow you to telekinetically move and throw objects and enemies, fly, move at great speed and slow down time. It would feature 2 player co-op and up to 8 players could battle it out online. There would have been a certain amount of freedom in how players used their powers and weaponry. You could have your Psy power in one hand and a gun in the other, but you could dual wield guns if that's your thing, or forego the use of weapons altogether and solely use your Psy powers. This looks like it would have afforded the player a lot of freedom in how they wanted to approach each level or deathmatch, grabbing and throwing environmental objects, destroying parts of the arena and shooting their enemies at the same time. The environment would actually become a weapon when side powers were introduced. Seemingly some money was mismanaged by one of the studio bosses so they couldn't complete the game. Well I say some, 20 million dollars. Plus there was some kind of scandal involving claims of sexual harassment. At this point they had completed two of the game's nine levels, reportedly costing $23 million. Ignition closed their Florida studio which was developing Reich in November 2010, a month after the game was originally planned to drop. What a shame this never made it, it promised big but the gameplay footage available does suggest that it would have been an interesting take on the genre and really fun. Eight Days, codenamed Heist, was a PlayStation 3 exclusive action game being developed by SCE London Studio. It would have a heavy emphasis on cooperative play and would feature both third person shooter and driving elements. It would also feature extravagant set pieces. First announced by Sony at 2006's E3, it was later cancelled around 2008-2009, although there were also rumours that the game was merely in limbo, with development to be resumed later. It was however shown before 2006 at E3 in 2005, but wasn't explicitly named, instead being used to demonstrate the PS3's processor via one of the game's showy action set pieces. The footage available resulted in a fair bit of debate as to whether it was true in-game visuals or merely cutscenes, but I'd say that it's most likely a bit of both. The co-op sections in particular do look like in-game footage and also show that there is an interesting dynamic between the two characters when working cooperatively, taking cover and honing in on their targets. Sony's decision to cancel 8 days in 2008 was apparently due to its lack of an online mode, which at the time Sony was shifting towards, prioritising first party games with significant online features. 8 Days was cancelled along with another game the studio were planning to make, a PS3 follow up to The Getaway. Aliens Crucible was an RPG based around the Aliens films, being developed by Obsidian for the PS3 and Xbox 360. 
The fact that Obsidian was the developer is pretty exciting for Aliens fans, considering their experience with this kind of game. The developers struggled a bit with the source material, they felt that it was too difficult to create a true horror game based on the franchise, as by that time everyone was fully aware of the aliens themselves and their behaviour. So instead of a horror theme they aimed for a survival game in which the aim was to, well, survive. They focused on the in-game environments and the consequences of a party member getting impregnated with alien eggs. If a team member was to get mouth raped by a facehugger, the player had the choice to quickly put them out of their misery, to put them into stasis for the time being, or to, of course, just let it happen and have an alien baby burst from their chest. Resources available would be strictly limited, so a certain amount of resource management would come into the survival aspect of the game. Deaths would be permanent, so once a team member was gone, they were gone for good. Despite the number of alien xenomorphs and humans that you'd encounter in the game, and inevitably kill, the only aim was to escape the facility in which the game takes place. It featured real-time combat, and commands could be issued to team members to instruct them to perform certain actions. Aliens Crucible was cancelled when the decision was made to cancel all Aliens franchise games in development at the time. Despite Obsidian's reservations about making a horror game based on the films, Creative Assembly managed to pull it off very well in their 2014 game Alien Isolation. An unnamed Silent Scope reboot was in development around 2011, after Konami approached Day One Studios asking them to adapt the series into a third person shooter for the PS3 and 360. The first Silent Scope arcade game was released in 1999. I absolutely love this game, it features a huge sniper rifle which is fixed in place much like Operation Wolf's gun. You move the gun around, sniping at terrorists as quickly as you can. Super addictive, it rewards practice and was a really fun twist on the on-rail shooter gameplay style, being much more methodical and less frantic. It spawned some sequels, with the series coming to several home consoles. This reboot would flip the series on its head, instead becoming a third person stealth game. So silent scope in name only really. It was described as an arcade Metal Gear Solid and would incorporate sci-fi elements. Day One Studios developed a short playable demo, but in late 2011 Konami scrapped the project. Redwood Falls was a horror first person shooter being developed by Kuju Entertainment in 2006 for the PS3 and 360. A short demo was created using the Unreal 3 engine, which is actually pretty impressive. In it, the player is exploring a cabin when a huge mutant appears outside. They then engage in combat, and two things are noticeable. One, the mutant moves quite slowly, which is actually quite sinister, and two, the mutant is shot about a hundred times and doesn't die. A virus allows these creatures, presumably mutated humans, to regenerate tissue, so killing them with traditional methods is nigh on impossible. In the demo, after a huge number of point blank shots, the creature is wounded but not dead. It takes a Molotov cocktail to finish it off. It seems that this would have been a large feature of the gameplay due to the enemy's regenerative abilities. You'd need to find more creative ways of killing them, like the aforementioned Molotovs, or by using traps. The developers promised an immersive experience. The game world would be quite open, allowing the player to explore and enter a town to interact with various characters. The short gameplay demo, to me at least, is very reminiscent of John Carpenter's The Thing with its snowy setting and huge mutated human-like creatures. Redwood Falls could have potentially been a really interesting concept. Kuju was bought in 2007, and interest in taking a risk on a brand new IP was low, despite the impressive demo. Around 2007-2008, Pivotal Games were developing Warfare Afghanistan, a reboot of the Conflict series, the first of which was Conflict Desert Storm. This was headed to the PS3 and 360. The idea was to return the series to what made the early games in the series great, with four player cooperative gameplay, both online and locally split screen. Coordinating tactically with your team would be at the heart of the gameplay, utilising each squad member's skills to suit the situation. Pivotal Games were keen to bring some new depth to the storyline too, 
and even went as far as hiring a military consultant to inject some realism into the plot surrounding the Afghanistan conflict. Warfare Afghanistan was still in development when the studio was closed in 2008 by Pivotal's parent company, so we'll never know whether or not this would have been a welcome return to form for the series. A new Road Rash game was very briefly being developed by EA in 2006. The only available footage is a very early prototype with very basic textures. Only the bikes and riders have any colour, with the scenery and cars being only grey placeholders. Not much to go on here, but still, it looks pretty interesting even at this early stage, and I'm a huge Road Rash fan. The footage shows some complex combat between the riders, a significant sense of speed, some big jumps, and some decent weapons animations. The player can grab road signs along the way and use those as melee weapons, which looks really cool. As I said, not much info, but definitely worth a mention. This one was a planned digital-only release, Fallen Frontier, being developed for PSN, Xbox Live Arcade, and PC by Moonshot Games. Moonshot Games was formed by some former Bungie employees, and this would have been their maiden project. This was a 2D scrolling shooter with some simplistic but stylish and moody graphics. It would feature both offline and online co-op, which would split the screen if the characters strayed too far apart. Each player has an array of weapons at their disposal, as well as a grappling hook, which could be used to reach platforms and to drag enemies across the screen. Moonshot cancelled Fallen Frontier in 2013 as they decided to shift focus to mobile and social games, which they viewed as being more publisher friendly at the time. Brooklyn Stories was an adventure game being developed around 2008-2009 by French studio Lexis Numérique, heading to the PS3, 360 and PC. The concept is reminiscent of the games from Quantic Dream, another French studio, being kind of an interactive story. Set in Brooklyn, obviously, the story is set between the 1930s and 2000s in an apartment building. During the game, the player would observe and influence several characters living there, observing their day-to-day -day lives, listening to conversations and even their private thoughts, and intervening in various ways. Player intervention would change the outcome of the story and the fate of the characters as the game progressed, but most interestingly there would be some sort of time travel mechanic, whereby time could be rewound to alter the decisions made. Changing the outcome of a particular event would change that character's storyline, and could even save them from death or seal their fate. I must say this idea is absolutely fascinating. You're like a voyeur, watching these characters through windows, getting to know their personalities, routines and deepest secrets. The inhabitants of the apartments could be persuaded to make certain choices or perform certain actions. As the trailer states, the power to travel through space and time will let you see the consequences of your acts and allow you to change destiny. The game consisted of chapters set in different time periods, each having multiple endings. You could even rewind time to see multiple outcomes of a particular situation by trying different things. Sadly, after two years in development, Brooklyn Stories was cancelled by the publisher, and the developers were unable to continue on with the project. What a shame, as this looks like it could have been an absolutely fascinating and unique take on the interactive movie genre. Pirates of the Caribbean Armada of the Damned was a planned action-adventure game with RPG elements being developed by Propaganda Games for the PS3, 360 and PC. This would be published by Disney in 2011 to tie in with their series of films. This promised an open-ended adventure on both land and the high seas. Set before the timeline in the films, sometime in the early 1700s, you'd take on the role of James Sterling, a pirate looking to make his mark in the Caribbean. There would be a large game world featuring enemies including pirates, voodoo, and mythical beasts. There would be RPG elements to the game too, moral choices players made during the game would affect their character and the outcome of the story, and players would earn XP to level up. The player would decide the areas in which their character would specialise by putting experience points into those skills. 
Choices made would also open up different quest lines throughout. The sword play combat system would be fairly involved, featuring counters and parries. Different attacks would correspond to different buttons on the PS3 controller, and linking these together would perform combos. From the look of it, the combat had a lot of similarities with games like God of War. There would be a significant seafaring side to the combat too, with the player engaging in sea battles with rival ships. In the end, Armada of the Damned was cancelled in late 2010, when Disney restructured the studio and let a lot of the staff members go. Wildlife Forest Survival is another digital-only game, heading to PSN and Xbox Live in 2011, developed by EA. This was an arena fighter of sorts, you control one of four cute woodland characters and battle it out in one of several arenas. There was a fox, a rabbit, a hawk and an alligator, each having their own strengths and weaknesses and differing requirements to win a match. Rabbits had the goal of eating as many carrots as they can. They were very agile, fast and could sense danger, but were susceptible to being eaten by the other three animal types. Foxes could eat both rabbits and hawks, and could track the former, but they could also be eaten by hawks and alligators. The hawks obviously had the advantage that they could fly, giving them a literal bird's eye view of the map. The alligators were slow moving on land, but could launch rapid surprise attacks from the water, and were at the top of the food chain so had no predators. Aside from the rabbits eating the carrots, I'm unsure what the goal was for the other three animals, I'm guessing it was to kill and eat as many animals as possible, with rabbits being the exception because they were the lowest on the food chain. Wildlife Forest Survival would also support online multiplayer with up to 12 players per map, but there would be a limitation on a maximum of 4 of any one animal type per match. EA eventually cancelled the project, it seemed like an interesting idea in practice, but one that would be hard to implement properly. Tiberium was being developed by EA sometime between 2006 and 2008 for the PS3, 360 and PC. It was a Command & Conquer spin-off which was interestingly a tactical first-person shooter. EA sought to use the squad-based tactical nature of the Command & Conquer real-time strategy games and bring it to a first-person shooter. The gameplay drew inspiration from Special Forces Ops, putting you in the role of a battlefield commander. From the sound of it, it was much more tactical than your usual FPS. Secure the area, scout the enemy, decide which units to deploy and where, order orbital strikes, and call in reinforcements when necessary. Up to four squads could be controlled at any one time, selected on the four D-pad buttons. EA promised a deep storyline which would continue on from where Command & Conquer 3 left off and would delve deeper into the franchise's history by looking at the origins of the GDI and Brotherhood of Nod. After two years in development, Tiberium was cancelled in late 2008 after it failed EA's quality assessment standards. Who knows whether or not this hybrid of RTS and first person shooter would have worked, but it would have been nice to find out. Final Fantasy Fortress was being developed by Swedish studio GRIN to be published by Square Enix. It's possible that the Fortress part of the name was just a working title, I'm not sure. This doesn't look very Final Fantasy, does it? And that's because it wasn't originally intended to be one. GRIN developed the concept as a Nordic-style adventure game and wanted to use the Lord of Vermilion license. When it was pitched to Square Enix, they were like, yeah, that's cool, guy, but make it Final Fantasy themed. So GRIN were in a bit of a pickle, as they had to scrap a lot of the work they'd already done in order to Final Fantasyize it, although Square Enix were happy to stick with the Nordic style. The developers promised a large game world with epic battles featuring over 2,000 combatants at a time, and some huge bosses. The idea was to defend the fortress from invaders, who came with huge monsters in tow, and between these sieges the player could go exploring the world. In 2009, after the studio released some duffers, including the absolutely awful Terminator Salvation, Square Enix pulled out and the studio went bankrupt. 
Seemingly, there was initially a deal in place for over $16 million worth of funding for the game, but Square Enix were not forthcoming with regular payments, so the studio struggled developing Fortress anyway. Ocean Warrior was in development from Stardust Media Interactive between 2001 and 2004 for the PS3 and 360. I'm struggling to define its genre as it was a weird mix of gameplay styles. At first this was to be called Extreme Outer Reef, described as a mixture of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and Waterworld. Hmm. This was, I suppose, an extreme sports game, with the player riding jet skis on huge waves towering over 200 feet tall through an abandoned city. It would feature a dynamic wave physics engine for the water, which would attempt to emulate the behaviour of real waves. At some point in the development process Extreme Outer Reef morphed into Ocean Warrior, an action game featuring armed speedboats but set in the same setting, i.e. post-apocalyptic abandoned cities and with the same enormous waves. It would also have several multiplayer modes, both online and in split screen. Stardust tried to pitch the idea to potential publishers but couldn't find any takers, probably because the idea is a bit out there. Faith and a 45 was a Wild West third person action game being developed by Deadline Games for the PS3 and 360. Initially intended to be set in a post-apocalyptic environment, the theme was shifted to a Wild West setting to be more publisher friendly. Set during the Great Depression, Faith and a 45 story was inspired by the notorious western couple Bonnie and Clyde and would follow a loved up pair of outlaws called Luke and Ruby. Deadline were aiming for a quote, gritty and emotional shooter, with cinematic presentation and an emphasis on cooperative play and the dynamic between the two characters. Deadline couldn't secure a publisher for the game and they went bust in mid-2009. A shame, as the small amount of demo footage available does look pretty cool, and I'm a sucker for a Wild West theme. State of Crisis was another hybrid of first-person shooter and real-time strategy, being developed in 2010 and 2011 by Darkworks for the PS3, 360 and PC. This was one of several concepts that Darkworks designed around this time to pitch to potential publishers. In State of Crisis, the player would be able to control several team members in a squad and switch between them at any time. There would be a focus on strategic assault, with each team member performing a different role. Each mission would have a set pool of money available, which would act as the budget for the mission. Ammo and tech would cost money to use, so every resource was somewhat limited. The aim was to complete the mission as fast as possible, while spending as little as possible. The faster the time and the lower the expenses, the higher the score achieved. Saving money on missions would allow for the purchasing of better gear for subsequent missions. Tech available would include a surveillance satellite which would allow the player to assess the level from above to map out strategic attack points, and perform various other useful functions including scoping out and tagging enemies, and ordering orbital laser strikes. Quite an interesting idea here, although it's hard to tell if it would have been good in practice or merely a gimmick. One thing of note is that the demo footage seems quite arcadey in its presentation. Darkworks were unable to find a publisher for any of their concepts in development and went under in 2012. Project Dropship, which is a working title, was a third person action shooter from Square Enix LA, being developed for the PS3 and 360 shortly after the studio's creation in 2008. This was being developed using Numerical Design's Gamebryo 3D engine and utilised a top-down third-person viewpoint. Looking at the available footage, Dropship was set on a strange alien world and had a sci-fi western theme, with some steampunk influences in the mix too, and seems quite linear on the whole. Up to four players could team up in co-op, taking on waves of enemies and using the environment to their defensive advantage. Enemies were either aliens or the planet's indigenous wildlife. Unfortunately, the footage shows very little actual combat. Dropship was cancelled in early 2011, and although it's a reasonable way into development, it was never even announced. In fact, they closed the studio before announcing anything they were working on.
Dancing Eyes was a very weird puzzle game that Namco brought to arcades in 1996. The core gameplay is very much like the early 80s Taito arcade game Kicks, in which you have to navigate around a grid of rectangles. Once you trace around the entire circumference of an area, it would fill in with solid colour. But Dancing Eyes was far more Japanese, and was aimed at the kind of people who would buy used undies from a vending machine. Yes, in Dancing Eyes you're tracing around rectangles that make up young ladies' clothing, and when you complete a section it removes that area of the clothing. Then boom, bra and knickers. In 2011, Namco announced that an HD remake would be making its way to PSN in Japan as a PS3 exclusive, featuring support for the PS Move controller. This obviously never happened, and it was quietly cancelled. Time O was a cancelled action game from Zootfly announced for the PS3 and 360 in 2007. Information is thin on the ground for this one, there are three very brief teaser trailers which all display the text, three days, two worlds, one chance. This is seemingly a reference to the alternate universe in which the game takes place, an alternate version of New York. The game's two protagonists have become trapped in a parallel New York, and must stop a giant machine from destroying the world, and they only have three days. Other than that, I don't really know much. The name Time O hints at a time-related element to the story or gameplay, and the O in the logo is stylized as a clock. But maybe this is just related to the game's time limit, who knows. James Bond 007 Risico was a Bond game being developed jointly by Raven Software Studios and Bizarre Creations. It would star Daniel Craig, based on the 1960 James Bond short story of the same name. The story followed Bond as he unravelled a heroin smuggling ring, which uncovers a Soviet plot to get British youths addicted. There are conflicting theories on why, but Risico was cancelled in 2009. Terraformations was a first-person shooter being developed by Star Cave Studios in 2006 for the PS3, 360 and PC. Not for the first time on the list, this FPS would have incorporated real-time strategy elements, including the ability to build factories. Terraformations was set on an alien world, or worlds, with varying locations and had several different species, each with its own unique weaponry and tech. There would also be four character classes, Soldier for the more traditional first person shooter experience, Engineer focused on building and repairing, Researcher developing new technology, and Commander which would lean more towards the RTS aspects of the gameplay. Set in 2157, the aim of Terraformations as hinted at by the rather unexciting name was to terraform previously inhospitable planets and moons. But alien races are soon encountered, and conflict ensues. At some point during its development the studio closed, and the groundwork was obtained by another studio, but the project was never finished. Devil's Third was a hack and slash action shooter that came to the Wii U in 2015 and to Windows later that year, although that version was limited to online multiplayer only. This was the debut game from Valhalla Game Studio, made up of ex-Team Ninja employees, led by Tomonobu Itagaki. He was a long time serving Tecmo employee, most noted for his work on the Dead or Alive series. Devil's Third was unveiled by THQ at 2010's E3, initially announced for the PS3 and 360. The trailer shows that some of the gameplay would remain similar in the final version, but there was an emphasis on firearms and melee combat, and some characters can be seen wall running. In contrast to the single character iteration that the Wii U received, the original concept featured a cast of three playable characters. Following this, nothing substantial was shown for years, until Nintendo presented another version of the game at E3 in 2014, which was closer to the final Wii U version, but I'm not sure what happened during that time for them to drop the PS3 release. Pilot X was a space shooter in development by Tornado Studios for the PS3, 360 and PC. Not exactly sure when this was being developed, but it was first announced in the late 2000s. This would combine third person arcade style space shooting with adventure game elements. Set some time in the future, you'd pilot a ship in solar systems all across the galaxy, taking on various combat missions. 
These would include assaulting planet-based facilities close to the surface within a planet's atmosphere and enormous spaceships out in deep space. As the game progressed the ship could be upgraded, adding shields, more powerful weapons etc. Visually the planets and outer space in general look fantastic, but perhaps the gameplay lacked a bit of depth here. It does look like a fun arcade shooter and I love this kind of game, but some adventure or RPG elements might have helped the studio secure a publisher, which they obviously didn't as the game was never released. The Witcher was an action RPG that came to PCs in 2007, but a console version was planned to come to the PS3 and 360 in 2009. The story followed a Witcher, one of a race of monster hunters with inhuman abilities based on a Polish book of the same name. This console version would be called The Witcher Rise of the White Wolf and would be a sort of definitive version of the original. It would add new features including a brand new combat system and would have enhanced graphics. There were some issues with CG Project Red, one of the two co-developers not getting paid on time and this led to the project's cancellation. The Witcher obviously never made it to consoles and PlayStation owners had to wait until The Witcher 3 on PS4 to get a taste of the series, whereas The Witcher 2 did come to the 360. WET 2 Double Feature was a planned sequel to the 2009 game WET, released for PS3 and 360, developed by Artificial Mind and Movement. A hack and slash action shooter, it saw the female protagonist slicing and shooting her way through the levels with the use of swords and guns, while showing off her acrobatic prowess by flipping and wall running around the scenery. First announced in 2010, WET 2 would see the return of the protagonist from the first game, Ruby, voiced by Eliza Dushku and would retain its core gameplay, heavily inspired by Grindhouse films. Sadly, there's very little media available, with most of the video simply testing the game's heads up display. The original WET didn't sell well, so this is probably why the sequel didn't happen and was cancelled after about a year in development. Pain Borders, also known as Pain Snowblown, was a planned follow-up to 2007's Pain on PS3. Pain was developed by Idle Minds, who also developed Cool Borders 3 and 4 for the original PlayStation, which is probably what gave rise to the name Pain Borders. The original Pain was part of that early PS3 era craze of using ragdoll physics. I remember those days well, loads of games released at the time displayed the Havoc game engine logo at the start, and it was mind-blowing seeing those ragdoll physics in action. In the original Pain you had to slingshot characters at targets in order to destroy the environment. Pain Borders would presumably have combined this concept with snowboarding, perhaps catapulting your character down a ski slope, but alas we can only speculate as there's no footage available. This rather weird footage showing a scantily clad woman being blown around a ski resort by several strategically placed snowblowers is from the Alpine Ski Resort level from the original. The developers promised a varied roster of characters, including a Yeti. Sony cut funding for the game at some point, and it was therefore cancelled. The Outsider was announced in 2005 for the PS3, Xbox 360 and PC. A third person action thriller, this was being developed by Frontier, the creators of Elite, and would be published by Codemasters. Set in Washington DC, The Outsider was a thrilling tale of espionage and conspiracy, clearly capitalising on the trend of TV shows and films surrounding counter-terrorism. The president has been assassinated and CIA agent John Jameson, the player character, has been framed for the crime. The ensuing chaos sees him navigating the streets of the capital as a wanted man, avoiding the authorities and searching for any evidence that might clear his name. So presumably the game was set in an open world city with missions to complete and clues to follow up on. The developers said that the outsider would have a dynamic storyline so the player's decisions in game would affect the outcome and also how NPCs would react to John. They also boasted that the player would have the freedom to change the story's outcome in a way not seen before. Very interesting indeed. For some reason, Codemasters dropped the game after five years of planning and development, which was a huge blow to Frontier both emotionally and financially. 
Interestingly, the project then caught the attention of EA, who thought that the CIA operative John Jameson was very similar to Jason Bourne, and floated the idea of rehashing the Outsider to fit within the Jason Bourne universe. Unfortunately, this idea never came to fruition, so the Outsider was completely cancelled. What a pity, as it seems like it could have been a really promising and unique concept. ID Software's Doom franchise was rebooted in 2016 with huge success, but prior to that another game was in development. This earlier version has since been unofficially dubbed Doom 4 1.0. Development started around 2008 with planned PS3, 360 and PC releases published by Bethesda. It was being made using id's id Tech 5 engine, the same engine used to create 2011's Rage which was the first game to use it. For reference, the 2016 Doom used id Tech 6. This was an unusual move for id Software as it was custom for them to use an entirely new engine for an entry in the Doom series, which was the case in the end of course when Doom 16 was the first game to use id Tech 6. This iteration of Doom 4 was sort of a Doom 2 reboot as it featured a similar scenario. It's hell on earth all over again. Hordes of demons are invading the planet and you would take on the role of an average Joe recruited into a band of resistance fighters. This was an odd departure from the norm for a Doom game. The post-apocalyptic world in which you're playing was more linear than the previous games, and the action was less frantic with a more cinematic approach. The world was very much a take on a modern day ruined war zone, with demons spewing from portals all over the city. It was jokingly referred to as Call of Doom by some during its development, alluding to its similarities with the Call of Duty games, and it's easy to see why. There were a lot of scripted cinematic set pieces and dialogue between the player and NPCs which would break up the usual hectic pace of Doom. It seems that Bethesda shared these concerns, later stating that they thought it was too much like Call of Duty with a Doom skin. In 2011 after the release of Rage it was decided that the idea would be changed entirely as id and parent company Zenimax felt that Doom 4 in its current form wasn't up to the standards expected from the series. At the time, publisher Bethesda expressed their excitement about the new, new Doom reboot, but weren't forthcoming on details. Doom 4 1.0 was obviously cancelled when it was re-envisioned in 2011, but some of its aspects did bleed into the 2016 Doom reboot, including some of the revised melee combat elements. Rat Race was an adventure game planned for an episodic release digitally on PSN. This was being developed by Super Ego Games with Sony Publishing. I'm not sure exactly when this was being developed but it was before 2008, so quite early on in the console's life. In Rat Race as the name suggests you're an office drone and in an extremely chaotic office. It's full of over the top characters and all sorts of madness is kicking off every opportunity. As an employee of Big Co, your only task is to survive a day amongst all the chaos. Its cancellation was announced by Sony at E3 in 2008. We haven't seen an entry in the Legacy of Kain series since the 6th generation of consoles, with several games hitting the PS2 and original Xbox, but a new game was in the works called Legacy of Kain Dead Sun. This was being developed by Climax Studios and would be published by Square Enix for the PS3, 360, PS4 and PC following their 2009 purchase of IDOS. Rather than be a sixth entry in the main series, Dead Sun was seen as more of a reboot of the Legacy of Kane franchise. In this distant future, mankind has become sterile and therefore unable to conceive. There would be two main characters, Gein, a vampire, and Asher, a human. When Asher and his pregnant wife are murdered at the game's start, Asher's soul becomes trapped in the vampire's body. Together, as one, they strive to find out how Asher's wife was able to conceive a child in the first place, and their journey of revenge evolves into a quest which will decide the fate of the entire human race. Thematically, Dead Son would have had heavy religious overtones. The game would be set in a large open world built on Unreal Engine 3, with everything you'd expect from the series, dungeons, bosses and puzzle solving elements. As in the two Soul Reaver games, the player would be able to shift between two planes of existence. 
There would also be a power-up system whereby the player could exchange harvested souls for ability upgrades. There are competing statements on why Dead Sun was cancelled, with the publishers stating that it wasn't the right game at the right time. It has also been said that it was too ambitious, pushing the PS3 and 360 to their absolute limits and perhaps even beyond them. Either way, Square Enix cancelled it in 2012 after three years or so of work, much to the disappointment of fans of the Legacy of Kane series, who are still eagerly awaiting a new entry in the series to this day. Parker was a planned survival horror game from Double Helix Games, slated for a 2008 release on PS3, 360 and Wii. This would feature vampire hunter Jonathan Harker as the main character from Bran Stoker's novel Dracula, who was played by Keanu Reeves in the 1992 Francis Ford Coppola adaptation. The story, set in the 18th century, would see a much more forthright and brave Harker than in the novel. He's on a vampire killing spree, exacting revenge on Dracula for attacking his wife. The game's producer stated that the combat in Harker would be quote, in your face, visceral and personal, with the vampires you're hunting fighting for their survival. So this wouldn't be a case of just walking up and staking the vampires, it would be a tough fight. You thought this would be easy? I'll guess again, pal. The vampires you'd fight would come in several forms, each having their own unique abilities. Harker would use anything at his disposal to fight them, including environmental objects. In 2008, Harker was indefinitely delayed so that Double Helix could focus on the development of Silent Hill Homecoming, but the project never resurfaced. This Is Vegas was to be a large-scale sandbox game with multiple gameplay elements, being developed by Midway and Surreal Software for the PS3 and 360. You would play as a guy who turns up in Las Vegas with 50 bucks in his pocket. You soon meet someone who introduces you to some of the locals, and after you ingratiate yourself, you encounter a fast food tycoon hell-bent on making Vegas a family-friendly destination, and he becomes the game's antagonist. So, as I mentioned, there would be a wide range of gameplay elements, and events in which to participate. These included gambling, obviously, I mean the game is called This Is Vegas, street racing, MMA fighting, and dancing. The game's presented in a GTA open world style, complete with minimap, but Surreal boasted never before seen levels of detail with its interiors. There would be several locations to visit, including clubs and casinos. Dancing involved taking part in dance-offs, which used the sequence of button combos format common to rhythm games. Get too drunk, and you won't be able to dance. Ripping it up on the dance floor wasn't the only pastime in clubs, you could also work behind the bar. This would work much like a minigame too, with you serving patrons their relevant drinks as fast as you can, or just run a wet t-shirt competition. Gambling played a big part as you'd expect, with casinos offering a multitude of games. Combat was also an integral part of the gameplay, not just in the ring, but when fighting on the street or in clubs. It essentially seems like a huge collection of minigames presented in this open world Vegas setting, but there would of course be a plot with story missions to complete. Development on This Is Vegas began sometime around 2006-2007, and wasn't cancelled until late 2009 when Midway were in some financial trouble. They sold off several assets, with This Is Vegas and developer Surreal Software being sold to Warner, as well as some other bits and pieces. By the time the game was sold to Warner, not only had a considerable amount of time been spent on This Is Vegas, but a reported $43 million had been spent on its development. Once at Warner, Surreal worked on some other things for a few months before Warner closed the studio in June of 2010. Presumably at this point, This Is Vegas was abandoned. Death Monsters was a 3D beat-em-up being developed by French studio Birdies Road. Development started around 2010, with Mindscape publishing for the PS3 and 360. The game would have a horror theme. Concrete details are scarce, but you would control an unnamed protagonist as he makes his way through some grim landscapes, presumably fighting all manner of undead creatures. There would also be puzzle-solving elements. He's also a werewolf, so you could turn into a wolf for certain sections of the game. 
The available footage from the prototype doesn't show much more than him navigating several of the levels, so beyond that we can only speculate. Death Monsters was announced without much fanfare in 2011, and a playable prototype was even created, but Birdie's Road closed that year due to financial trouble after Mindscape allegedly didn't pay them for several months. Aftermath was a top-down shooter from White Moon Dreams, being developed in 2009 for the PS3, 360 and PC. The aim was to make a retro-style multiplayer action shooter with RPG elements. Although Aftermath would have a retro Smash TV vibe when it came to its gameplay, they clearly went for a modern style graphically. The story followed a group of four wasteland wanderers as they blast their way through a post-apocalyptic world. Sounds a bit Fallout, doesn't it? Well, incidentally, one of the indie developer's co-founders and creative director was lead concept designer for the original Fallout. They pitched Aftermath as Diablo 2 with guns. The RPG elements would include levelling up the characters, complete with skill trees. Enemies would include mutants, human military factions and armies of dangerous mechs. It was set several generations into the future after a mysterious war that destroyed most of the planet has occurred, although none of the survivors know what happened. Hordes of deadly robots have emerged and are going on mass killing sprees. A group of survivors calling themselves the Wanderers seek to discover the source of these robotic attackers and save the Earth's remaining inhabitants. White Moon Dreams couldn't secure a publisher for Aftermath, so it was cancelled. Attack of the Killer Rabbids from Outer Space was the working title of a game that was later renamed Killer Freaks from Outer Space. It was being developed by Ubisoft for the PS3 and 360, to be released in 2010. If you haven't guessed from the game's title already, this would be a Rayman spin-off, featuring savage alien versions of the Rabbids. This first-person shooter would see you take on the role of a human, perhaps a soldier, trying to rid the Earth of these alien invaders. Creating a Rabbids game with such an adult feel and mature themes was a risky one, and one that Ubisoft soon realised was a mistake. They changed the title to Killer Freaks from Outer Space, and announced this change in 2011. Another announcement they made at this time was the game's shift to the Wii U, on which it would be a launch title. Eventually the whole concept changed yet again, and morphed into Zombie U, which replaced the toothy alien invaders with good old zombies, and was released on the Wii U in 2012. So that was a whopping 35 cancelled PS3 games, but there are many, many more. As usual, let me know in the comments which ones you think look decent, and which are best left on the scrap heap. I'll see you soon for another episode in the cancelled game series, and as always, thanks for watching. You can find the other episodes in my cancelled game series in this playlist. 